So, um, in the time I'm running, I'm just going to take you through um, uh, quickly the sort of importance of the small airways in our evaluation of people with inflammatory airways disorders. And although Lynn is right in saying that this is not really um, product supported, in fact, in this case, I'm going to um, support a particular product and I'll explain why. But this is just to remind you that uh, the airways actually uh, generate out 23 different generations, and every time they divide, they get smaller and smaller uh, until out here in the final five or six divisions they're really no bigger than the size of a hair. Um, these ones have cartilage around them, these ones are um, supported by smooth muscles. The ones out in the small airways right outside are just membranous, they've got very little support <coughs> and so I guess it's not surprising that they're most uh, vulnerable to, to damage and that's just making the point uh, in a different way. So. Um, uh, we were talking previously about the fact that the small airways are particularly vulnerable to damage. If you look at remodelling and asthma, the first evidence of uh, some damage occurring is in the small airways. If you look at smoking-related airways disease, the first uh, evidence of damage is in the small airways. And this is the pathogenesis bronchiectasis, whether it be as a consequence of them developing small airways damage due to asthma or COPD or even adenovirus infection or whooping cough in childhood initial insults in the small airways and you get recurrent infection as a consequence of that and as a result of which you get peribronchial uh, inflammation and then fibrosis and that actually causes dilatation of the larger airways which is what we know as um, bronchiectasis. So um, in terms of small airways disease and asthma it's not being studied very often and one of the reasons for that is it's actually quite difficult to study it and so it's been um, basically uh, uh, disregarded for a long period of time. So more recently, uh, people have looked at it in more detail. Historically, people said, oh, because small airways aren't important. Does, does asthma is a problem of the larger airways? Well, that's wrong. There's inflammatory cells just as frequently present in the small airways as there are in the larger airways. And also, people said, well, the steroid receptors are only in the upper airways. Well, in fact, there's more steroid receptors relatively in the smaller airways and even in the alveoli than there are uh, in uh, the upper airways. So the small airways are actually very important. And here's a slide, this is a um, post-mortem of an asthmatic, very mild asthmatic, died in their adolescence as a result of a car accident. <coughs> and you can see that already they're, under they're actually getting some remodeling uh, going on sort of down here in their airways, uh, even though they were only mild asthmatic. So um, small airways are important um, and uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, so how do we assess them in real life? Well, we're pretty limited in that. The only thing we've really got is the flow volume loop as part of um, your spirometric evaluation. Um, but if you do find evidence of people with impaired uh, small airways damage uh, at the time of spirometry, uh, you identify a group uh, who actually have more severe asthma they're more likely to have exacerbations, they're more likely to have an increase in bronchial reactivity, and they're more likely to have lower uh, responses and uh, a lower control as identified by the asthma control questionnaire. So they're a group that, um, that are, uh, uh, are under, more, um, uh, under, under more pressure. Guess what's happened more recently is people have said, well, heck, these small airways are really important. What are we, should we be doing more to measure them? So in the lung function lab, we do uh, residual volume over total lung capacity. We actually look at that to look at that. Um, in the old days, we actually used to do um, nitrogen washouts, and we don't do that so often. But uh, more recently, lung function labs are introducing impulse oscillometry, which is a good way of evaluating the small airways. And um, also, study undertaken at the Brompton Hospital and at Green Lane Hospital about 20 years ago showed that, in fact, CT scans are a good way of evaluating whether you've got small airways damage or not. So this is, uh, instead of getting people to do inspiratory scans, you also get them to do an expiratory scan. And although the lights are up, you hopefully can see that on an expiratory scan, what happens is that it becomes uniformly gray. And you can see this person's got patchy black areas here. So in fact, you can measure this. This is about 60% by volume of damage to the small airways. Uh, so small airways damage actually is, um, is very important. So if it's important in asthma, what about how we're getting on with actually treating them? Well, we're not getting on very well. So all the inhalers, apart from QVAR, that, um, that Nicholas showed you, only deposit in the first four or five uh, generations of the airway. Doesn't matter which one you look at, 
that she looked at, and even if you take it through a spacer, the great majority of medication only goes to the proximal few uh, generations. So uh, that's, a co that's a concern. And so what uh, <coughs> um, happened in the 1990s was that um, uh, we had to get rid of CFCs out of metadose inhalers, and I was on an international committee where we were evaluating that, and it was, there were 10 respiratory physicians there, I think. All the pharmaceutical companies were there, the FDA was there, um, and it was agreed at that meeting that we would transition to non-CFC and use the new uh, Freon HFA-134A. Permission was given to 3M Riker to go and do this because they could fast track it, because Riker developed the first metered dose inhaler back in the 1960s, and they had the plant to actually evaluate this new inhaler. They came back to the next meeting and said, yep, we've achieved this, but interestingly, we've created a much more finer particle <coughs> size, and interestingly, 60% of it gets into the airways and into the, all the airways, not just the first few generations. The physicians around the table said, fantastic. The pharmaceutical companies disappeared, um, and they went and uh, developed their dumbed-down non-CFC versions. And we asked as to why that had happened, and there were two possible reasons, three possible reasons as it turns out. Uh, one was maybe there was going to be a commercial uh, you know, benefit to 3M Riker. The second, the FDA were there, said, well, if you uh, deposit it more into the airways, you're going to have to do these studies over again, and that's going to cost the industry another billion dollars to repeat all the studies that were done previously. And, um, and that's going to take some years, so if you're going to try and get rid of CFCs, That'll delay things. But we also thought that um, the drug companies were concerned uh, particularly about um, depositing flixotide any better into the smaller airways, and there's a reason for that. So here's uh, the extra fine QVAR. It gets down to <coughs> 1.1 micron. Remember, the small airways are less than 2 microns. So it's the only inhaler that can achieve that. Everything else is up here. Here you've got 4 or 5 microns down to 3, 2.6. So what does, so if you give it people QVA, what was the sort of uh, benefits of it? This is, uh, this should be CFC. This was uh, 100 micrograms of CFC inhaled steroid versus uh, 400 micrograms of CFC versus 100 micrograms of HFA. And you can see 100 micrograms of HFA, that's the lower end of the dose response curve, was pretty well equivalent to the 400. But here's the um, uh, 800 micrograms being higher if you used FEV1 what happens if you use FEF 2575? Actually, bigger differential look quite exciting to us is that this could be you know, quite an important breakthrough. But because combination therapies then took hold and because of some marketing by the pharmaceutical companies, this never really took off. And as a consequence of which, um, it never got funded by Pharmac back in the 1990s. But Pharmac have funded it uh, last year. Um, and uh, is it useful? Well, what happened was that the company wanted to get it out in the market because it didn't want to spend a billion dollars, and it didn't do all the studies it should have done, but it did what I would describe as dose equivalent studies. It said, well, let's just cut our losses and let's market this as a two to one uh, sort of uh, basis uh, in terms of its efficacy. So here you have it against Pulmacort, effectively, with uh, 800 micrograms, so it's half the dose uh, equivalent dose of uh, budesonide and quite a high dose. And what did they find? They found that in fact it was more effective. This is underpowered to show no difference, but in fact it was more effective at half the dose than the equivalent. And even with comparison with flixotide, there's a thousand micrograms of flixotide a day with just 800 micrograms. It didn't show any statistically significant difference, but here in the yellow you can see everything that they looked at was actually a better outcome, and in fact, daily asthma symptoms was statistically better off. And so it seemed to be better than two to one. It seemed to be three or four to one. Uh, and, um, uh, and, but nobody at that stage was looking much at the small airways. Here's a study done more recently, which shows actually, if you look at the small airways, the biggest improvement is actually in small airways function. And what about the real world? Well, it never really took hold because of the fact they didn't go through all of these studies, and so it's been underutilized everywhere in the world where it has been funded. But this is a real world study looking at pharmacoepidemiology in the UK and the US. And what they did was to look at 1,319 patients who got flixotide matched for the same, you know, for 1,319 patients who got 
QVAR, um, and they were um, basically just administered it by their GP, and then they basically followed them up a year later. And you found that the group that got uh, QVAR were actually better off. They had better <coughs> asthma control test at one year. Uh, their adjusted exacerbation ratio was a little less, but it wasn't statistically significant. <coughs> but here's the dose they ended up on. That was 160. Now remember, uh, because of its e increased efficacy, it should be the same as fluticasone. Fluticasone is twice that of beclomethasone. Um, and you can see that, in fact, it's, um, it's about, given that it's got improved outcomes, maybe three to five times more effective than yeah, the equivalent dose of uh, inhaled steroid. They actually also ended up on less beta agonist, although that wasn't significant. What about the US? Well, the US, because they're in the US, they use bigger doses of infliximab on average, <laughs> but they ended up on the same doses of, um, of uh, QVA. So again, no statistically import, uh, uh, difference in uh, outcome, but a dose which was about a, um, a third of the dose that they uh, would have received if they were getting infliximab. When it came out, the other companies said, well, if you deposit more on the airway, you'll end up with more on the systemic circulation and more side effects. And that was a cloud that was cast over it. But in fact, beclomethasone does get into the systemic circulation and greater, uh, the more drug you put into the airways, the more you'll get into the systemic circulation. But beclomethasone, which was in QVAR, gets cleared within two hours. It's very protein bound and it goes. And so you can't see much of any evidence of any systemic effects. Um, and people have looked at that in more detail. Converse, if you look at fluticasone, and this has only just recently been published, uh, it has a half-life, it has a half-life in the systemic circulation of 14 hours. That's because of its lipophilicity, and uh, it's bound to adipose tissue, and therefore it achieves a steady state. And so it's been worked out that, in fact, I think that's 370 micrograms a day, that might be a typo, that 30% of patients on a current dose of 370 micrograms a day of flexitide have actually got a bit of adrenal suppression. So if there's any concern, I'm, I'm saying that, you know, in terms of systemic side effects, I'd be more concerned a little bit about the fluticasone at the moment. So what's happened in terms of New Zealand drug prescribing habits? Well, in the 1990s, we had inhaled steroids as monotherapy, and the number of people who were on it as monotherapy has got down to uh, reduced by about half. And of course, in, in, re in return, we've got now uh, patients, an increasing number of patients on inhaled steroid and LABA. Um, and you'd think that if we're getting this right, the sort of combination of inhaled steroids, et cetera, the impact should be that we should be getting uh, a fewer short-acting beta agonists dispensed. But look at this. This should have, uh, this sh if we've got this recipe right, this should be doing that. It's doing that. So I'm not sure, we can't really read too much into it, but I'm just letting you know at the moment, I think we're not targeting the inflammatory cell sufficiently well. We're overusing long-acting beta agonists, and I think uh, we're still using far too much short-acting beta agonist. As Nicola said, there's lots of inhalers around, and, it's, uh, uh, and I think that uh, potentially adds some confusion. It's great to have pharma, because in fact they limit the numbers that otherwise would be available. But you can see it can get a, it can get a little confusing at times as to uh, what to use, where and when. Um, uh, and in terms of uh, particle size, I said uh, you can improve particle size by putting it through a spacer but it only ever gets up to about 31% uh, into the airways when administered via a spacer, and even then it doesn't get down to the small airways because you're still not getting it down to that critically small size. Um, I just thought I'd finish off this talk by just sort of overlapping a little bit with um, COPD. So this is just talking about the use of a long-acting beta agonist and a long-acting uh, anti-muscarinic agent. They're coming around and they're before Pharmac at the moment. But you can see if you add labas and lamas together, you end up with a better effect than if you use a long-acting beta agonist or a long-acting anti-muscarinic by themselves and uh, better than uh, Spireva by itself as well. So these are around the corner and it may well be that for our COPD population, we'll be able to have them on just one inhaler a day um, where they just take one puff which will be easier for them and therefore uh, more critically important, they get the inhaler technique right. Um, and that improvement is sustained over time. Uh, and it's seen with other products. This is just another lava lama combination. This is uh, uh, aclodinium and fomoterol together. Um, uh, this is AstraZeneca versus, uh, uh, and that's in different doses. So that's a six, uh, 12 micrograms versus 24. And then that's them administered separately.